Uh, well, thank you, John. All right. Well, it recently occurred to me that we're in the midst of a golden age for Oxfordian research and publishing, and we have been for some time. That idea occurred to me as I was looking through the lists of Oxfordian books that Alex McNeil ran in the fall issue of the Shakespeare Oxford newsletter. Uh, you've probably all seen these lists compiled by a dozen or so Oxfordian scholars. But note the dates of publication. Most are from the most recent decade. Look, here's 2018, 2019, 2021, 2005, 2013. The point being that there has been such a flood of important publications during the last decade that calling it a golden age isn't an overstatement. And the flood isn't ending. Even more important uh, Oxfordian books have come out since those lists were published and still others are on the way. For instance, Stephanie Hopkins Hughes's long awaited Educating Shakespeare will soon be released. Uh, Hank Whittemore has a new book coming out, The Living Record, uh, which is a concise edition of the ideas in his The Monument. A second volume of the collections, uh, of, the collect uh, collections of uh, Bronson Feldman's writings, edited by Warren Hope and published by Laugwitz Verlag in Germany, will soon be available. And as we heard earlier, um, Michael Delahoyd, in addition to the Oxfordian edition of Twelfth Night that came out recently, is working on Oxfordian editions of The Merchant of Venice and A Comedy of Errors. And of course, every issue of the Oxfordian under Gary Goldstein's editorship is chock full of important articles. Of special importance is Robert Prechter's comprehensive list of every work written by Edward de Vere, together with discussions of why the pieces on the list are included and why others aren't. Now, it could be that not everyone will agree with all of Bob's decisions, but that's beside the point. That we now have in hand a list that can be discussed and debated is a development of the greatest importance for the Oxfordian movement. But all this thinking about the current golden age got me thinking about another golden age, a period of only seven years, 1928 to 1934, in which some two dozen important Oxfordian books were published. Again, that's two dozen important Oxfordian books in only seven years. I want to show you a, a list of them. Uh, here it is in chronological order. You can see that in that, that brief period of time, there's important books by Captain Bernard Ward, Percy Allen, Gerald Rendell, Gilbert Slater, uh, Ava Turner Clark, and several other, others. Now it's these books together with the, the two that John Thomas Looney published early in the 1920s that formed the foundation of the Oxfordian thesis. Yet most of these books are little known today, even by Oxfordian scholars. The reason being that they're out of print. They're available only in expensive and hard to find first editions or in what are essentially bound photocopies, which are also expensive. So I became familiar with these books through the research I did to write this book, Shakespeare Revolutionized, uh, the one that uh, John showed you earlier, but my history of much of the Oxfordian movement over the past century. In reading them, I learned many important things about the Oxfordian idea that I hadn't known before and that have been lost to history. The evidence in support of Edward de Vere's authorship is far stronger than most people today, even most Oxfordians realize because they aren't familiar with those early books. So I decided to bring these, work, these books back into print. I've spent the last six months and will spend the next year preparing new editions of many of them. Over the coming year, I'll bring back into print more than 20 books and booklets and more than 130 articles first published 1920 to 1945. So here's the same list with the works in blue, those that I will bring back into print over the coming year. You can see it's about two thirds or three fourths of those published during that earlier golden age. But now these books will be issued in editions that are scholarly yet reader friendly, like what I did for um, Looney's Shakespeare Identified, this book a few years ago. They'll have modern typesettings with annotations and footnotes and bibliographies and indexes to make them as informative as possible. Now, here's what a sample page, a typical page looks like. I think it looks beautiful and uh, I'm hoping that readers will agree. 
Okay, but the, one of the most important things about these, these books is that each volume will have an extensive introductory essay explaining the context in which the works were, were originally written, why they were important at that time, and why they're still important today. First to be released will be a seven volume set of the complete Shakespeare writings of Percy Allen, the most important Oxfordian scholar after Looney himself. Um, so those seven volumes include Allen's nine books. Uh, this is what they look like in their first editions, uh, five shorter works, uh, pamphlets or booklets, and more than 120 articles uh, grouped mostly chronologically. Uh, those will all come out at the same time in the summer, hopefully in June. Then in the fall, uh, I will bring out Gerald Rendall's uh, two books on Shakespeare's sonnets and poems in one volume, uh, Shakespeare's sonnets and Edward de Vere, his first book from 1930, and uh, Personal Clues in Shakespeare's sonnets and poems, poems and sonnets uh, from 1933 or 34. Again, those are coming out in one volume. And at the same time, I'll issue another volume uh, on Shakespeare's handwriting and the play Sir Thomas More. Now, in recent discussions on this subject, even Oxfordians have made no mention of three important books on it. Three books that I think are the definitive word on the subject. So I'm bringing them back into print in one volume. And these books are uh, Sir George Greenwood's Shakespeare Signatures and Sir Thomas More Greenwood's Shakespeare's Handwriting and the Northumberland Manuscript and Gerald Rendall's Shakespeare's Handwriting and Spelling, all in one volume. And then at the end of the year, uh, I'll issue a new version of uh, Gilbert Slater's Seven Shakespeare's, a very important book from 1931 uh, that discusses uh, seven people who could have, uh, for whom a, a, uh, a solid claim could be made that they were Shakespeare. In the end, he concludes that it was Edward de Vere who was Shakespeare, but he has very interesting things to say about each of the others. Then about a year from now, um, I will put out a new edition of Captain Bernard M. Ward's The 17th Earl of Oxford. This is a work of the greatest importance, not only for the information in it that Captain Ward uncovered about Edward de Vere and literary life during the Elizabethan era, but also for its place in the Oxfordian movement. After several slow years in, in the mid 1920s, this book jump started the movement early in 1928, just as Charlton Ogburn's The Mysterious William Shakespeare did at the end of 1984. Uh, now let's return to Percy Allen and the seven volumes of his complete writings on Shakespeare that I'll bring out in June. All right, here's um, a summary list of the contents of each of the seven volumes. Um, so you can see, for instance, that the first volume includes two books, one pamphlet and some articles. These are all of his writings on Shakespeare before he became a publicly announced Oxfordian. So they're his pre-Oxfordian writings on Shakespeare. And then the others um, are basically in chronological order uh, until his final works in, in volume seven. Now, although Allen is most often recalled as uh, an outspoken proponent of Edward de Vere's authorship of Shakespeare's works, he actually made contributions in many areas of Shakespeare studies apart from the authorship issue. I've identified six major thrusts of his work, three related to understanding the plays and poems apart from the question of authorship, and three others that address the authorship issue directly. And here's a slide showing uh, summaries of them. Cool. On the Shakespeare studies side, Allen identified topical influences on the dramatist that other Shakespeare scholars of his time had misunderstood or overlooked, thereby deepening understanding of the plays and shedding light on obscure passages in them. He also documented just how deeply Shakespeare's fellow dramatists and poets, especially Ben Jonson, George Chapman, and Edmund Spencer, were influenced by and copied his works. And Allen showed just how widely the Elizabethan mindset differed from modern ways of thinking and demonstrated that an informed imagination, an imagination informed by accurate historical knowledge of the earlier period is necessary to understand the Elizabethans and their literature. On the authorship side, 
Allen strengthened the evidence in support of Edward de Vere's authorship in many important ways, including ways that many Oxfordian scholars are unaware of today. I'll have more to say about that in just a moment. He also introduced and developed what has become known as the dynastic succession theory, sometimes called the Prince Tudor theory, that explains why de Vere published under a pseudonym and how such a deception could have succeeded at that time and for hundreds of years thereafter. And he recorded far more extensively than anyone else, the activities of those active in the Oxfordian movement, the growing influence of the Oxfordian idea, uh, and the response to it by Orthodox scholars during the first wave of the movement uh, during the 1920s and 30s and the first half of the 1940s. These six major thrusts of Allen's work reinforce each other and uh, are in fact so intertwined that it becomes impossible to study any one of them without also examining the others. His writings on Shakespeare really do constitute one big work spread out over two decades. That's why I'm publishing all of his Shakespeare work and releasing all seven volumes at the same time. Now, in examining the ways that Allen's work strengthened support for the idea of Oxford's authorship, I identified nine distinct lines of evidence. In my introductions, I show that Allen contributed much to strengthening the five lines of evidence that other Oxfordian scholars had launched before he began his work. But what is most important is that Allen launched and developed four new lines of evidence, three of which are largely forgotten today. One of those lines was his showing that other dramatists of the time, including Johnson, Chapman, and Spencer, often alluded in their plays and poems to Edward de Vere, to Shakespeare, and to de Vere as Shakespeare. References that were largely unknown or unrecognized for what they were before Allen pointed them out. This was a discovery of the greatest importance and one largely forgotten today. I'll give you one example from this line of evidence. In his earlier books, Allen had shown that having knowledge of the Elizabethan era would help scholars and readers today understand Shakespeare's plays and those of other playwrights better. He continued to make that claim in his fourth book, but also made the reverse claim, that the plays themselves can teach us much about developments in the society in which they were written. In his interpretation, many passages in the plays of Johnson and Chapman depict events that happened in real life for which no documentary evidence is known to exist. Without this literary evidence, we would not know that they had occurred. One example is the scene uh, in Johnson's Every Man Out of His Humor that in Allen's interpretation depicts an interaction between Edward de Vere, William Shakespeare, and Queen Elizabeth. Historical records provide no evidence that Shakespeare ever met the other two. Allen's in, Allen interprets the passage as depicting Oxford presenting William Shakespeare to Queen Elizabeth under the guise that he is a gentleman who is such an accomplished actor that he can portray even yeoman convincingly. She's fooled at first, then realizes she has been put on and responds as Mother Nature does in those commercials for chiffon margarine in which she's been fooled into believing that the margarine is her delicious creamy butter. Remember those commercials where she says, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature? Well, Elizabeth's response is similar. I want to read to you Alan's description of that passage so that you can get the full flavor of how he presents his findings. If my identification of Johnson's characters is correct, Alan writes, it follows that we have here one of the most enthralling and enlightening scenes in the whole range of topical burlesque in Elizabethan drama. Namely, the man of Stratford himself, whose acquisition of a coat of arms and laborious ramping to gentility have been mocked at in an earlier scene, brought before Queen Elizabeth herself as a scholar, a linguist, and as a gentleman. He is further described to the Queen by Oxford as, in addition and transcending all, an actor of consummate ability who doth so perfectly imitate any manner of person for gesture, action, passion, or whatever, including among his best imitations, that of a rustic or clown done so close to, closely to life that no keenest observer can find the sparks of a gentleman in him. Keen satire indeed is uh, Alan's uh, comment. So if Allen had indeed pierced through the cover story to the real life events depicted underneath, he has presented new historical information not recorded elsewhere. 
that a meeting between the Queen and Shakespeare actually took place, and that it was known to Johnson and presumably others in the theater world. So this is only one of the scores of passages in the plays of Johnson, Chapman, and uh, Spencer that in Allen's interpretation depict real life events, many of them relating to the authorship of Shakespeare's works. So given the importance of Allen's Shakespearean writings, how did it come about that his books and pamphlets soon went out of print and his articles and reviews were never collected until now? Part of the answer lies in the onset of the Second World War in the second half of 1939 and the crushing burden it placed on England for the following six years, and in fact, even for a decade beyond. Another factor was Orthodox scholars' resistance to the idea of Edward de Vere's authorship. So eager were they to defeat the Oxfordian idea that when it came to Allen and his works, they threw out the baby with the bathwater. Better in their minds to suppress all of Allen's work than to try to preserve his writings on Shakespeare's works in ways unrelated to the authorship question, which might have led inquisitive scholars to discover and consider his evidence in support of de Vere's authorship. Such a discovery would in fact have been inevitable because the six principal thrusts of Allen's work, as I pointed out, were so tightly interwoven that considering any of them must lead to considering all of them. They come as one package. Take it all or bury, all, or bury it all were the only options and they chose the latter. Many Oxfordians too were eager to bury Allen and his work to escape an idea they found repugnant and which uh, they believe could harm the Oxfordian cause, whether it was true or not. This the dynastic succession theory. The idea that the Virgin Queen and Edward de Vere had a liaison from which resulted a son who became known as the third Earl of Oxford was simply beyond the pale for the people who ran the Shakespeare Fellowship in the decades after the war ended. They too were willing to throw the baby out with the bathwater to escape being charged with tarnishing the reputation of the Virgin Queen. Even in combination though, those factors might not have been sufficient to bury Allen and his work had he not given them a shovel. In the early 1940s, Allen was using a spiritualist medium to communicate with his deceased twin brother. He went on, he believed, to connect with the spirits of Edward de Vere, Sir Francis Bacon, and William Shakespeare. Once his plans to publish a book of transcripts of his conversations with them became known to trustees of the Shakespeare Fellowship early in 1946, Allen was forced from the presidency of the organization. Quickly and almost completely, he became to the fellowship's leadership a non-person, and in their view, an embarrassment to the organization and the Oxfordian cause. Better to cut all ties to him, they thought, than to subject their organization and the Oxfordian cause to ridicule. And so the work of the greatest Oxfordian scholar and greatest spokesman for the Oxfordian idea during the critical decade of the 1930s was lost, until now. With the upcoming publication of my seven volume collection of Allen's complete writings on Shakespeare, his revolutionary ideas about Shakespeare's plays and the effect they had on other dramatists and poets of the time, and his launching four new lines of evidence in support of De Vere's authorship, three of them now forgotten, will once again be readily available. In sum, the evidence in support of the Oxfordian claim is far stronger than most Oxfordians today realize because so much of what has what was uncovered in the earlier golden age from 1928 to 1934 has been forgotten. My hope is that bringing the works of Allen and other early Oxfordians back into print will dramatically increase the evidence that can be cited in support of Edward de Vere as the principal author of Shakespeare's works. Thank you very much.